All right, so for our next series of lessons here for Unit 2, we're going to stay within the Mediterranean world, right? In our first series of lessons, we looked at Achaemenid Persia, the Greek city-states, and Alexander's Hellenistic empires. Um, you know, and those are all rooted in the Mediterranean, or at least the Eastern Mediterranean. We're going to stay within the Mediterranean world here uh, for our next phase of our study of the Classical period, and we're going to look at Rome. And the first thing we're going to look at here is the Roman Republic, and then the Roman Empire, and then finally we will cap it off with a, a brief study of Christianity, which is an important, um, an important force in world history that comes out of the Roman Empire and the classical world. So I know I've been reminding you of this a lot, but you got to keep this in mind. This is not about memorizing facts. This is about developing skills, right? So. Keep in mind, you know, keep thinking about the differences between period one and period two of world history. Remember your spice factors. Keep thinking, is this a social thing, a political? Is this about interactions with the environment and technology? Is this about culture? Is this about economics? Right? You're doing the categorization now. You're doing more thinking. Um, I'm maybe doing less thinking. I don't know. Uh, you know, compare and contrast. And finally, continuities and changes. Right, so naturally here we're gonna have some changes as we go from the Greek period of Mediterranean history to the Roman period of Mediterranean history, but there's going to be a lot of continuities as well and things that don't change even as the Greeks lose power and the Romans gain power, right? So first let's look at the definitions for republic and empire because this is going to be a big change for the Romans, right? Republic has the root word public, uh, republics are all democracies of one form or another, and they're generally made up of one people. Um, in fact, changes to the racial, religious, ethnic, and political characteristics of the American Republic over this past century have changed how we think of this definition. But you know, the early American Republic was white, and it was Christian, and it lived in the East, and you know, it was very much like the Republic is just us, whoever us is. Same for the Greeks, they had these, you could call them little republics, although they did have kings. For the Romans, it's the same thing. As we're going to see, there's only one people. And so it's very easy to have that uh, republic. Empires you know, have a ruler who's an emperor, who's above the law and who can change it single-handedly. Um, and emperor, empires are kind of like kingdoms, but they're formed through the conquest of multiple other peoples and other states. So you get a mix of you know, ethnic groups, you get a mix of religions, the people don't necessarily look the same, they don't necessarily speak the same language, even though they're all part of this empire. That's a conversation we may have in this unit, whether the United States has become an empire as it has become more multicultural and has taken over more different groups of people, right? I mean, we're still a democracy. We still elect our rulers, um, but we have, we're starting to develop some of the features of a, of a classical empire as well. All right, so let's look at the origins of the Roman Republic, which is what the rest of this lecture is going to focus on, right? Uh, the Romans are an Indo-European people who migrated to the Italian peninsula beginning in 1000 BCE. And Indo-European is an important term. I, I just, I haven't fit it in yet. I haven't made a big deal of it. I could have, but it just didn't seem to fit, right? The Indo-Europeans are from right around this area right here. And you've got some overlapping groups that kind of make up this, but this is all the Indo-Europeans all in through here. Uh, as you can probably guess from the root word, India and Indo-European. So you get these migrations first into India, right? These are the Aryans, remember them from the classical period. You start to get a split off into this area, a split down into Iran. These will become the Persians uh, and the Medes. Uh, you start to, these groups start to filter in and they kind of sneak around the edge and end up in Anatolia. This area is Mesopotamia and that's not an Indo-European people. They were already there, well set up. The Indo-Europeans were not going to come into Mesopotamia. They'd get their butt kicks, their butts kicked and sent back home. They start to move down into Armenia, Greece, 
Albania, go across into Italy, out into France and Spain, Germany, up into the British Isles, into the Baltics. Right, so those are the Indo-Europeans. Um, and we know this because of the genetics of the people, as well as their languages, right? Uh, uh, Sanskrit, which is the language of the Aryans, Persian, um, Greek, Italian, uh, Latin. The, the languages are all very closely related, right? But so these Romans were just another one of these Indo-European tribes. They're kind of semi-hunter-gatherers although they're learning agriculture as they go. They had some limited contacts with the Greeks, but really they were ruled by the Etruscans. So, you know, in they come and they get set up down here. Um, the Etruscans are already there. The Greeks are already there. And they set up their own little area. Uh, but the Etruscans control them. They're there first. They're an older culture at this point. So they're pushing the Romans around and telling them what to do. <clears throat> but around 510 BCE, Roman aristocrats, who were ethnically different from the Etruscans, they rebelled and took control of the lands around Rome. And this is an important figure here. This is uh, Junius Brutus, uh, who is one of the leaders of the revolt against this man who is known as the Tarquin. <clears throat> the Tarquin was the last great Etruscan king who ruled over the Romans. And so these Roman aristocrats, they re, uh, revolt, take over, the Etruscans are gone, and they set up, you know, this kingless political structure. So, you know, we've been ruled by a king, we didn't like that. We want a respublica or a republic, a democracy made up of equals uh, or at least people with land and money, right? Poor people are still not uh, getting a whole lot of power. But, uh, you know, they, they set up this Roman Republic. And again, they have no king, so they have to find a way to organize themselves. So, you know, number one here is the Senate, uh, who are elected men. Uh, they are wealthy landowners and aristocrats. Uh, they're being elected by the wealthy landowners and aristocrats. Um, but they had to give the poor people some power. And I think this kind of goes back to what happened in Athens and Sparta with the Greeks, that you can't leave the poor landless people with no power, um, but you don't want to have them a lot. You don't want them to have a lot of power because, you know, that they're just little dirty peasants, right? So they developed this system of the tribunes, right? And the tribunes were elected by the lower classes, the so-called plebeians or plebes. And we'll even use that term now to refer to lower class people. Sometimes uh, freshmen in high school, freshmen in college are referred to as plebes, you know, just the little people. Um, and the tribunes could challenge the actions of the Senate. They didn't have as much power as the Senate, but they could kind of veto or overturn or say no to what the Senate wanted to do. And then there were also the consuls who were elected by the upper classes uh, to one-year terms, and they were in charge of the Senate. So they're kind of, and I think they were, usually there were two or three, um, and they kind of were like the American president, but not that much, not that powerful. Really, you know, the top power belonged to the Senate. They also developed the 12 Tables of Roman Law that defined all this. It was kind of like a constitution, kind of like our constitution. Um, you know, so these people believed in the rule of law you know it wasn't about what a king or an emperor said it was what the laws said and the laws are also determined by the senate although the tribunes have a little bit of power uh, and the consuls have some power too and so um you know the the early americans you know washington and jefferson and benjamin franklin hamilton alexander hamilton they, they copied a lot of these ideas from the romans so if you're trying to imagine what the roman government is like you just kind of have to imagine ours you know as i said though you know rome like most civilizations has rich people they have poor people um, but they had a very well-developed idea of patronage um, you know, that wealthy upper-class men gave money and support to lower-class men who worked for them 
and were loyal to them. Uh, this system was also known as clientage. In other words, the lower classes are the clients of the upper classes. And you, know, you can kind of see this uh, pyramid, this hierarchy right here. You know, Rome won't have, it's a terrible arrow, I know. Rome won't have an emperor yet. Um, you know, so it kind of only goes to like this level. Um, you know, and if you're kind of trying to imagine, you know, this clientage system, just think about the Sopranos, right? Uh, or really think about any gang. Uh, you've got people at the top. It's all about favors, right? It's not about laws. It's not about who owes money on paper. It's an understanding of connections and juice and who's got who's back. Uh, a little bit about who owes who money. Um, but it's not formal like a government. It's not formal like a banking system. It's, um, you know, it's part of the gray area of a society. Now, one of the things that defines Rome is its military power. I mean, we're talking about arguably the greatest military in world history. I mean, nowadays we just send a few F-16s in and bomb the snot out of them. But if we're going to compare um, apples to apples here, the Romans might have been the greatest military power in world history. Maybe the Americans are the only uh, group more powerful just, you know, because we've got uh, so much military power now that the Russians have gone down. But, you know... The thing about Rome is they really valued the military. They really, that, you know, to be a man, you had to be a soldier. And that's the only way a man could be a man is through, you know, military capabilities. Um, and so, you know, the way for a man to rise in the Roman system was as a soldier. Um, you know, and as a soldier, he would gain land, he would gain slaves, and he would plunder, right? Plunder is... Plunder is a word we don't really use anymore. It's kind of like if you win a war, you take stuff, right? Americans are funny, right? We, we go into Afghanistan and we don't take their land and we don't take their stuff. We try to give them a new government and make them stable because we want to leave. Or we go into Iraq and we don't take over Iraq and make it you know, the 51st American state. We set everything up and then we leave. It, Classical armies aren't like that. The only way to go to the only reason to go to war was to get stuff. You know, this is a jack move. Like, you know, give me your land, right? Uh, and so, a, a Roman man who wanted to become more powerful and rich, he joined the army, um, and that you know made him a man, and that got him stuff. You know, and it's also a feature of the political system here too. The consuls were in charge of the military, and they only had a year in office to gain glory as a war leader, and so this almost meant that you know that they were constantly at war it's like oh here's a new guy who's he going to beat up you know he, how's he going to get power well you know let's go pick on someone but it's not like these guys were selfish right i mean you think about the clientage system or the patronage system if your patron wins a war that's going to be more money for you that's going to be more powerful for you because that's your kind of leader that you follow if he's got more power and money that's going to be more power and money for you so the whole system Really, and the idea here is social mobility. Social mobility is how you go up in a society, how you become more rich and more powerful. And for the Romans, social mobility is its warfare, period, end of story. <clears throat> and so one of these early wars that the Romans fought was against Carthage. And I pointed out Carthage earlier. They were a Phoenician people <coughs> whose capital city is right here, um, you know, modern day Tunisia. And you can see they're very, very close to Rome uh, in the Italian peninsula. Um, and Rome really felt threatened by Carthage. It's not really clear whether Carthage was a clear threat to Rome. I mean, they were big and strong, but they didn't really seem like the kind of people who were going to go out and, you know, they didn't seem like conquerors at the time. But, you know, Rome's this up and coming power. You know, they're looking for someone to beat up to prove their manhood. Carthage is a nice target. You know, and so the Punic Wars, and this was a series of wars, they began in 264 BCE. And, you know, they ended up being a true existential war for both sides. Now, existential, um, the root word here is exist, as in <clears throat> the winner of the war would exist and the loser of the war would not exist. Um, so this is an existential war for both the Romans and the Carthaginians. 
um, you know, it was close. The, the great general Hannibal, uh, you know, moves his war elephants across <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the Straits of Gibraltar and all the way up the Spanish coast over the Pyrenees and over the Alps. I mean, this guy led <clears throat> an army of elephants. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the Alps. If you haven't, you know, after this lecture, look up, go to Google Images, look at the pictures of the Alps. Imagine leading an army with elephants across the Alps. It was crazy, but it was a brilliant move. Nobody expected him to do it. Nobody was crazy enough to lead <laughs> elephants through the Alps except Carthage. And uh, he almost took out Rome. He almost won. Um, but eventually the Romans won. And they won, and they were, they were crazy. I mean, you've got to understand, the Romans were flat out crazy. I mean, they killed everyone. And they went into Carthage, and they, they put salt in the earth. They put salt down in the soil so that crops couldn't grow. And they just completely ruined the natural environment so that, I mean, Carthage is done. Their, their people are in chains or dead. They can't grow crops. That's it. That's the end of Carthage. And that really puts Italy in... The power position in the central and western Mediterranean and uh, from here on out no one can challenge the Romans <clears throat> and the Romans expand right I mean because again manhood and virtue come from killing people and taking their stuff you know in fact Rome's uh, conquest of Spain had some horrible atrocities right an atrocity is just a I mean you're talking about like cutting people's fingers off and you know putting people on stakes and just I mean they just smashed the the, the people of Spain or Hispania as it was known then um, you know and then later on they conquered Macedon right uh, the Antigonids are a, a dying dynasty remember the Antigonids were one of the smaller dynasties that took over after Alexander the Great you know they, they conquer you know the whole Greek Peninsula uh, they place a protectorate over Ptolemaic Egypt, you know, and so really at this point everywhere around the Mediterranean is controlled by Rome. And then they start pushing up into Gaul and Germany and then across into Britain. Um, and that's it. I mean, you'll hear sometimes the Mediterranean called, you know, Rome's bathtub or Rome's lake. Um, you know, and part of this was to get land. Part of it was because of, you know, to get slaves. Um, slavery was very important to the Roman economy. They didn't enslave their own people, so they had to go out and conquer others in order to get those slaves. And this starts to bring about a series of crises in the Roman Republic. I mean, first the Gracchus brothers, uh, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus, tried to limit the power and the size of large estates. And these are the large farms that were owned by the rich. Right, because they didn't want too much money and too much power in the hands of too few men. And again, you can always get more money, but you can't get more land. And because Rome had a professional army, I'm going to write that just to remember, they had a professional army. You know, and so as these men would be off at war for sometimes five or ten years, their their estates would fail, and then their estates would be bought up by you know these rich people. Oftentimes, they were senators who would you know buy up these estates and create these super estates and get super power and really threaten the republic. I mean, this is a threat to the republic if you have too much money in too few hands the republic is going to be threatened because those people are going to be so rich and powerful they can tell everybody what to do and the Gracchus brothers tried to turn that back they tried to get land back in the hands of more people tried to get more people citizenship the rich people didn't like that and so the Gracchus brothers were killed <laughs> literally um, after them you get uh, the general Marius who begins to use plebeians and non-citizens in his army and he's brilliant general and his his men would follow him anywhere and this provokes a civil war against the Sen senate's general a guy named Sulla and so that really this is a battle of rich versus poor um, the rich have land and money and political power the poor have numbers and a desire to fight and so you get Marius uh, the great leader of the poor and the plebeians versus Sulla the, the rich people's man 
um, you can see how this would tear, absolutely tear the Republic apart. Um, you know, I fear that uh, this will happen to the United States. I hope it doesn't. You know, and and this continues on in the 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 um, civil war between Sully or Sulla and uh, you know Marius is done, <clears throat> but this quest for glory and rule continues. Right, with these great families trying to get more power, and they've got all their clients behind them, and the the republic is really dividing into these different camps, and it reaches a climax in the Roman Civil War of 49 BCE when Julius Caesar defeated Pompey, <clears throat> and he became so powerful that they named him consul for life or dictator, and so in effect he becomes the first emperor of Rome, although he's not really called that. You know, and, and just um, a little while later, he's assassinated, killed by a lot of these Roman senators. In fact, the most famous of those Roman senators is uh, Brutus. Now, this is not the same Brutus who killed the Tarquin, uh, led the rebellion against the Tarquin, um, but he's of that same bloodline and, and family. And, and really, the killing of Caesar was viewed as an attempt to preserve the republic and to keep these rich people from becoming too powerful but it sets off another civil war again these families are too big too rich and i don't mean big as in they have a lot of kids i mean big as in they have a lot of homies they have a lot of clients they have a lot of people in their gangs and you know they're getting big and, and uniting everyone um, in their little camps and so this sets off another round of civil wars between Caesar's nephew, a man named Octavian, <clears throat> and Caesar's top general, a man named Mark Antony, uh, who at the time was the husband of the Ptolemaic queen Cleopatra of Egypt. A um, very famous play about Antony and Cleopatra and their love and eventual suicide. Um, and Octavian wins, and that makes him the first true emperor of Rome. And he becomes known as Caesar Augustus. Now at this point, Caesar is going to become a title. It's no longer a name like Brahman. It becomes a title like Mr. or Doctor. Um, and uh, we're on the way to the Roman Empire. And so that's it. You know, The next lesson will cover the Roman Empire and the aftermath of the collapse of the Republic. This is such an important time period to study because you know we live theoretically in a republic um, but if we don't watch it we could become an empire stay tuned